Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Marian Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is April Xiaoyisu. I'm currently a junior at Pomona College, majoring in politics and minoring in Spanish. I'm currently serving as the editor in chief of the Claremont Journal of Law and Public Policy, CJLPP. Hello, everybody. I'm Henry. Uh, I'm a senior here at CMC, and I'm the CEO of the journal. Uh, in, addition, in addition to print editions and uh, running a blog about public policy and law, uh, the journal also hosts a range of events, including this event. Uh, we are extremely excited about today's event uh, and are delighted to host Pomona alum, Judge Halim Dahanidina, for this AF talk, Dissent in Democracy. We also cordially invite you to our later event at 3.30 uh, in McAllister. It's an MSA event uh, where Judge Dahanidina will be sharing his perspective on discrimination and resilience. Uh, first, we'd like to extend our thanks to the Pomona College's offices of uh, alumni engagement uh, and career development, the Athenaeum, our colleagues at uh, CJLPP, and of course, Judge Dahani Dina for making this event possible. Judge Dahani Dina is a Los Angeles County Superior Court judge, currently assigned to hear criminal court cases in, Los, um, in the Long Beach Superior Court. Prior to his current position, Judge Dani Dina was a deputy district attorney for the Los Angeles County for 14 years, prosecuting cases for the elite hardcore gang and major crimes divisions before serving in the district attorney's special operations administration. As an attorney, Judge Dani Dina served as a board member for the Asian Pacific American and South Asian Bar Associations, where he developed and implemented various programs designed to, pro um, to provide services to tradi traditionally underserved communities. Judge Dahani Dina is also um, currently an adjunct professor at Whittier Law School and Western State School of Law. He teaches civil trial advocacy, criminal procedure, and legal ethics. He's a board member of the Interfaith Organization, the Muslim Jewish New Ground, the Asian Pacific American Bar Association, and the Orange County Advisory Council of Asian Americans Advancing Justice. Judge Dani Dina earned a Bachelor's of Arts degree in International Relations at Pomona College. He graduated in 1994 and he received the Senior Service Award. Later on, he received a JD in the UCLA School of Law in 1997. Today, we have Judge Dani Dina with us addressing the crucial role that dissent plays in all aspects of democratic life. With a special focus on the role of dissent in the ju judicial decision-making process. So without further ado, I am very excited to introduce the Honorable Judge Halim Danidina. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Yes, good, okay. I'll try to use my uh, outside voice. The microphone here will work. Uh, I want to thank uh, April and Henry for the invitation and for the Law Journal for bringing me back here to Claremont and back on campus. Uh, it's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, those of you who are getting close to graduation and definitely feel ready to leave the bubble, perhaps, um, it's completely understandable, but you're going to find uh, in short order that you're going to take every opportunity that you can to come back. Uh, there's something about being here. Uh, here in Claremont and on, at the five colleges that is just, uh, it's comforting to me. And you're gonna find that when you leave. You're gonna start to miss the sorts of people that you get to be around. Uh, so definitely soak that in for the remaining time that you have here. Uh, it's, it's something that you're always going to treasure. Uh, I'm not gonna take up too much time by way of uh, anything introductory, uh, because I wanna save a lot of time for question and answer if you uh, have any questions about what I want to talk about, but as you've already heard, uh, I'm here to discuss the role of dissent in democracy. And dissent is not a word necessarily that you use a lot uh, until you go to law school. At least that's, that was my experience. Um, who here by a show of hands is interested perhaps in pre-law or going to law school or something like that? So quite a few of you, okay. So I will tell you this. Um, one of the things that I learned going to law school uh, and I went to UCLA after leaving Pomona College, is uh, it's a different style of teaching, a different style of learning, uh, something that you're most definitely not going to be used to. Uh, coming to the Claremont College, you, you do a lot of uh, heavy reading, I think, heavy reading assignments. That will get increased uh, tenfold when you go to law school. You are going to be reading 
all the time. And part of that is because most of what we learn in our law school curriculum comes from Supreme Court case decisions. And if, for those of you who have not yet had the pleasure of reading decisions from the Supreme Court, rest assured, they are long. Uh, one of the prerequisites of any Supreme Court justice is that that justice, he or she, really enjoy writing, and I think they all fit the bill. They all really like to expound uh, in great detail on their ideas. And I think that there's nothing inappropriate about that, but as, as a student, you go into survival mode. And you start to think of, okay, I've got this many hours left of the evening. How am I going to digest all of this and all these courses that I'm taking? So one of the things that I did, uh, foolishly, was I started to sort of prioritize these reading assignments. Um, the teachers never told you, you know, pay particular attention to this section or that section. They would just kind of give it to you. And one of the things that you need to learn right away in law school is how to read a case, how to read a case decision, and how to glean information, the important information from the decision. And what I discovered, and some of you may already know if you've read some of these decisions, is that the decisions are made of different components. Uh, you have three different flavors of opinion, uh, the majority opinion, you could have a concurring opinion, and you would have a dissenting opinion. And so just by way of very brief uh, uh, introduction to you, the majority opinion is a portion of the Supreme Court decision that five or more members of the court agree on by way of the result and also the rationale. That is the legal authority that is going to be followed uh, thereafter after that case. But sometimes the justices agree on the result, but they don't agree on the rationale. And so a justice might write what's called a concurring opinion, meaning they agree with the result of the case, but the reasoning is different. So concurring opinions are not authority necessarily, the reasoning, because they don't have five justices agreeing. So sometimes, you know, a law student like me in survival mode might kind of skim the concurring opinions. Uh, and then you would have the dissenting opinions. So a dissenting opinion would be written by one or more justices that disagrees with the result of the majority as well as the rationale. They see the case in a completely different way. And in my mind, being the you know, pressed for time law student, I thought, well, why on earth would I waste any of my time with a dissenting opinion? These are the people that lost, right? So why do I need to know what the losers thought about a particular case? And I have to say, and I will confess, that was not particularly wise uh, on my part. There's a reason why the professors in law school want you to read all of the different opinions, especially sometimes the dissenting opinions. And that is part of what I want to talk about today, not just in the context of you know, reading cases for law school, but more in the context of society and how it's structured, how our democracy is structured, uh, and why dissent is so important in all phases of society as well as the judicial decision-making process. One of the things that you realize when you're reading a dissent in a Supreme Court decision is that it can get kind of emotional, right? The majority opinions tend to not be so enthused because, you know, they won. So they're going to say, they're going to break it down and just tell you how it is. This is what the law should be. This is our reasoning. Deal with it. Goodbye. And then that's it. The dissenting opinion is the justice who really feels like something wrong is happening. And imagine what that must feel like, right? You go through this legal career, you end up at the pinnacle, you're a justice on the Supreme Court, and now you're not getting your way. And that can be infuriating. And some justices, based on the composition of the court, find themselves writing dissenting opinions a lot. And it tends to be the same justices writing during any you know, period of time, writing a dissenting opinion. And what does that do to your psyche? Imagine. Right? After a while, you're just, it's like banging your head against the wall. And so they use very colorful language and um, can get really emotional about uh, what, their, what their position is. And you can completely understand why. That, you know, for entertainment value alone, that's a reason to read a dissenting opinion. Because it's so much more interesting than the drier type of majorities that you might read. And one of the things that I've noticed is that perhaps these justices are using their 
position to write a dissenting opinion as a form of almost personal catharsis. It, the, it's their way of sort of getting it all out so that they can go on to live another day and they don't you know, burst a blood vessel in their head. And there's nothing wrong about that. And I, and I don't even really mean to be overly facetious, facetious when I say that because that's really the role of dissent in general in our democracy. The ability to dissent, the ability to disagree and to express yourself, to express an opinion that is not popularly held, that you think is right. That has value in a free society. There are a lot of societies in this world, uh, even many that consider themselves to be free democratic societies, where you can't so easily do that. There are certain topics that are taboo, that are off limits, certain things that you can't say. And so what does that happen to the individual when they don't have that ability to express themselves against sort of the powers that be? It's dangerous. Uh, one of the things that it does is it drives, tends to drive people underground. It alienates people from a system that really works best when everybody feels invested. And if you can't even express your disagreement with the people who are in charge and the decisions that are being made for you on your behalf, it completely drives a wedge between you and the rest of society and civic institutions. So there is value in that role. One of the most interesting and important parts of a dissent in a judicial decision, I think, is that it, it enables you to engage in time travel. And who doesn't like to travel through time, right? Everybody does, it's fun. Just imagine, if people are gonna ask you, if you could say something to yourself in 20 years, what would you want that to be? Or sometimes they do it in reverse. Like people would ask me, if you could give yourself advice when you were a college student, what advice would that be, that kind of thing. Uh, that's what dissents do. That's the role that dissents play in court decisions. Because oftentimes the justice that is writing their dissent is writing it knowing that it's going to be read in the future. Sometimes the dissenting opinion is actually a little bit before its time. Most of the major Supreme Court decisions that we can think about as they relate to civil rights and other very important aspects of constitutional law started out as dissents. And only over time did they eventually, through the composition of the court, through changes in society, get to a point where they were popularly held beliefs. Right? It's a, it's, there's a, a, a saying that I'm, I'm going to paraphrase, probably butcher, but when you start out with that unpopular opinion, you start out as just a regular person. And when more people buy onto it, then you're a rebel or a revolutionary. And then when enough people sign onto it, you're a genius and a leader. And that's what dissents do. Uh, some of the most eloquent decisions that have been written in the Supreme Court history started out as dissents because they later morphed into what became very popularly held opinions. Another thing that dissents do is that they maintain the credibility of the court. The court system, like all other public systems, I think, relies on public confidence and a certain degree of buy-in, right? If you live in a democracy, these institutions, they belong to all of us. But they only work if we really believe that if we believe they belong to us, that the institutions are responsive to us, that we have a role to play, that we are not alienated completely from the decision-making process, that's what dissents do. Because they give voice to people who maybe also in society will disagree with what the court is doing. And for those people, they will see a dissenting opinion and they will think, you know what? One, I'm not crazy. Because one or more members of the Supreme Court, for God's sakes, agrees with me. It articulates a vision for the unpopular. And without that articulation of a vision for the unpopular, people in the minority would constantly feel alienated from the majority and from our institutions. And courts really only work if people think that they work. Honestly, that's the big secret. The same way democracy only works if people participate. Right? You can have a democracy if no one's voting. It's not really working. It's not really majority rule. I remember I took a, a politics course uh, at Pomona when I was here years ago. And there was a presentation on democracy and majority rule as it relates to voter turnout. 
And when you look at the total population, then you look at the population of registered voters, and that's only a fraction, and then the population of registered voters that vote, and then of those, the portion that voted for a particular candidate or policy, you're talking about something in the teens, maybe, of eligible voters making decisions, and is that really majority rule? So the courts are similar in that sense. If the minority feels like they're not involved at all in the decision-making process, they're gonna drop out. And that's why we enable, we kind of bake into the judicial system this ability to express dissent. It allows you to articulate different visions for what you want in society, for what you think the Constitution means. You know, that we use a lot of very generalized terms in the law. You know, something is reasonable, something is burdensome, these are very subjective terms, and they involve a lot of value judgment. And if you feel like your values are not being reflected in any of the decisions, you're just not going to buy into the system anymore. And that's dangerous, I think, for everyone. The law is not static, right? The Constitution doesn't really change, obviously, unless you amend it. But the way we view it, the way we interpret constitutional principles changes over time. Dissenting opinions are part of that mechanism, allowing that change to occur. It hasn't always been that way, obviously, and not to delve too much into a history lesson because I want to try to stay contemporary, but almost immediately after the Constitution was ratified and became the supreme law of the land, all kinds of, honestly, unconstitutional acts were passed in Congress, a variety of sedition acts, which made it, in particular, illegal to disagree with the government, in particular at times of war. Well, imagine that, the most crucial time for society to have a voice in policy, times of war. That was a time where you weren't allowed to agree or would be, or allowed to disagree. You'd be criminalized. You'd go to prison. And people did go to prison for years for disagreeing with, at different times in our history, our country's decision to go to war and to fight a war. The modern view of dissent and how we understand the First Amendment, I think, Conventional wisdom dictates that, well, everyone can express whatever opinion they want, right? This is America, it's a free country. You can disagree, you, can, you have freedom of speech. People like saying that, I have freedom of speech, I can say what I want. It hasn't always been that way. That is a modern view. And that is a modern view that started out as a dissent. The view of the First Amendment and free speech used to be that you could say whatever you want, you could print whatever you want in a newspaper, but the government still had a right to throw you in prison for doing that. That used to be the law. That's how the majority of the Supreme Court used to see freedom of speech. And only from a very famous dissent by Oliver Wendell Holmes did that start to change, did this new vision change, which is freedom of speech involves in particular your ability to disagree, in particular your ability to push back against what the majority wants even if it's something that went against your, the country's war effort or what the majority of the country wanted. That was precisely the time to allow people to express unpopular uh, visions for the country. And this serves two, com I think, complementary goals, right? One is the individual, as I've indicated, so you can still stay engaged and have a voice. And the other is societal to talk to the future, to talk to our future selves, to articulate a position that maybe we're not ready for now, that we will be ready for to the point where we won't even be able to imagine the day before that opinion was articulated. That's what giving dissent in society allows us to do. I see this happen in many ways every day in court. As, as you heard from the intro, I'm a uh, trial court judge, and so I preside over trials, criminal trials, some civil trials, sometimes legal arguments that are made in front of me. And oftentimes the jury is the decision maker, sometimes it's me. But one thing that's baked into every case that ever comes in front of me is this ability to dissent, to disagree. It's an adversarial system. So in every case, there are two sides. One's gonna win, one's gonna lose. Both sides get to be heard. Both sides get to disagree with the decisions being made to the point where it's not just symbolic. 
if someone disagrees with something that happens in my court, they can take that to another court and take it up on appeal. And usually there's another appellate opportunity after that. So this ability to disagree is so crucial to what happens in the judicial system because if we just take it for granted that whichever side wins, that that's the last say, then this alternative vision never gets to be articulated. And in many ways, the evolution of society is cut off sooner than it can be, than it should be. Nowadays in particular, right, we are ex all experiencing an era where there's a certain degree of fluidity to the truth, right? Courtrooms are supposed to be a search for truth. And so we like to say in court, we give both sides a chance to present it. Whichever the jury believes, whatever the judge believes, that's the truth. And only through competing visions can we arrive at the truth. That may not be the case necessarily anymore, right? We have alternative facts and things that we thought were conclusively provable as true that maybe are not as much anymore. Uh, so now even more so, it's important to have this competition of ideas in court the same way we do in the rest of society so that ultimately we can determine the validity which which position is stronger and which one has less merit but the one that has less merit now may end up being the position that has more merit later and we'll never know that unless we allow people to articulate that alternative vision i, I know this is primarily a social sciences oriented group is anyone here studying any of the hard sciences like, okay, there's a few of you here. All right, so for the scientists in the room, uh, how, do you how do you determine the truth of anything, right? You, you make a, a hypothesis probably, you do some degree of testing, some experimentation, and you analyze that. But that's not the end of the story, right? There has to be a certain degree of peer review. It has to be replicated. And there's not always consensus in the scientific community, and you think that, well, there ought to be, it's science, right? But these are hard, that's, we, that's why we call it a hard science. It's supposed to be conclusively provable. But that only works at a point where an idea has been sufficiently tested. If you don't have that contradicting opinion to constantly test the truth or the validity of a position, you may far so off, stray so far off the path of truth that it's unrecognizable. I mean, sci it used to be scientific fact, for example, that the Earth was flat and the sun went around the Earth. That was fact. And anyone with a brain would tell you that at a certain time. But then, people were allowed to, sometimes under penalty of law, uh, were risked, risked imprisonment and incarceration to express an alternative view. So what we think is true today, even things that we're so sure of, may be revealed not to be true tomorrow. And the only way we as a society can ever arrive at that point is if we continue to evolve by allowing this constant probing and testing of these altruisms that many of us hold to be conclusive today. Uh, we're going to find, I think, that that is the only way a healthy, free society can operate. Uh, one of the most famous jurists that I read about in law school is uh, a judge, Learned Hand, who was never on the Supreme Court, but he was an appellate court justice. And he articulated this in a way that I think has always stuck with me, which is, if we as a society are to be saved, it will be through our skepticism. And I think that's true. Because the moment we stop being skeptical, the moment we stop allowing other people to be skeptical of us, is when society is doomed and we'll never be able to recover from that if we want to keep a free democratic society. And this has to do with all aspects of life. Criticisms are so critical in all aspects of the government, economics, morals, societal norms. Our differences ought to be celebrated and encouraged, even when people disagree, especially when people disagree. I think too often we fear that type of disagreement and discord, right? I, I think the conventional wisdom, popular media will tell us something is wrong when there is protest, when there are people who disagree, when society seems polarized, that's a word that's used a lot, right? We should be, we should be able to agree on things. Why aren't, we why aren't we agreeing? Like something is wrong, something is broken. And 
I think that's the opposite. Signs of discord in society are symptoms of a society's health, not sickness. The more everyone's agreeing on everything, the more we should be wondering, why is everybody agreeing on something? That's not normal. That means we're not going to be probing our, our accepted values. We're not going to be growing as a society. We can't know how true any of our beliefs are because no one's testing them. And it's they, those, these truisms start to lose validity. And we, we see it oftentimes in terms of love of country, right? People will conflate patriotism with complicity and acquiescence. And again, these are opposites. They're not the same thing. Love of country, I believe, demands, it requires that you disagree. It requires that you criticize. It's to, to borrow maybe inappropriately a, a term from the sort of Homeland Security parlance. If you see something, say something. If you see something that you disagree with, something that even most people agree with, if you see something wrong with that, you need to speak up. And schools like the Claremont Colleges and where we are, these are the incubators of that ability to be critical and to articulate that alternative vision. So at the very least, we know that what we believe to be true really is true because it's been tested. Acquiescence, I think, is the enemy of a free society. Democracy is a lot like a child. Um, and I, I usually bring up my kids whenever I speak to an audience, and I understand most people here don't have their own children. Uh, but you're gonna have to take my word for this. When you have a child, they're cute. You love them, right? You hold them close, you do anything for them. Some of the time they smell good. And you, you cherish them. But it's not enough to cherish your child. Most people would consider it neglect if all they did was cherish their child. Because as a child is growing up, when they do something wrong, when they do something that puts them in danger, you have to criticize. It's part of education. You have to tell them when they're on the wrong track in order for them to stay on the right track. And if all you're doing is praising and loving your child, that's great. But you're committing child neglect. In a criminal court, you can go to jail for that. Democracy is the same way. Dissent, in many ways, as a, as a result, is the highest form of patriotism. So when we have a society where dissent is allowed and encouraged, we know that the search for truth, the ever-present search for truth, is alive and well in that society. We know that our beliefs can withstand scrutiny. We know that our democracy is strong, not weak, by measure of how many people are out in the streets protesting and disagreeing. The more passionate, the better. That's a sign of society's strength, not weakness. Silent consensus, that's the sound of a democracy dying. Or of course, I could be completely wrong, in which case, I encourage you to disagree with me. Thank you. Thank you so much again. So we now have time for questions for about 15 minutes to 10 minutes. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand and Harry and I will be coming to you. Hi, I'm David, I'm a junior at Pomona. Hi. Uh, when a decision from your courtroom is appealed, how closely do you follow the progress of that case afterwards? Well, I would like to say that um, I'm so curious to know whether the smarter appellate judge is going to agree with me or not. Um, just by sheer logistics, uh, I can't really stay on top of it because the next wave of cases comes through. Now, there is a mechanism built in where I'm informed, so I, I get notice when a decision is appealed, I get the briefings, and I get the decision. So I at least will know if I've done something another gr judge has disagreed with. Um, but uh, I feel like to get too personally involved would 
um, damage the professional distance that I try to have between myself and my cases so that I don't feel, I, don't, I wouldn't take offense, for example, if I were overturned. Um, I think that's an unhealthy way to be a judge. Um, hi, my name is Rebecca. I go to Pitzer College. Uh, what advice would you have for someone who's interested in pursuing law as a form of social justice and a form of um, public uh, to protect the innocent and to help the public? Well, you know, uh, obviously I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, um, but, you know, I truly believe the legal field offers so many opportunities for people to get involved in social justice type issues. Um, oftentimes, it's the only field, really, where you can go into a courtroom and uh, achieve some measure of justice for people who oftentimes don't have that access. One of the most rewarding things for me uh, as a lawyer and now as a judge is that I'm s serving communities of people using skills that I've gained over the years to help people that on their own couldn't navigate the system. And if you feel like that's really your calling, if that's something that brings you satisfaction, I would highly encourage uh, a career in law because that really oftentimes in the courtroom, at least in a civil society, what you know we're supposed to have, the courtroom, that's the, that's the last resort. And we've seen that some, uh, to varying degrees of effectiveness over the years. Uh, sometimes there's justice, sometimes there's injustice. But you can't even be involved in the conversation uh, unless you have that specialized training and on behalf of other people can help them navigate that process. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, you talked a lot about dissent at all times and how it's important for the ma maintenance of democracy, but then there's also some times where uh, you obviously need national unity so a country can come together to defeat a greater opposition than any disagreements you might have within a democracy. So where would you draw that line where you can have dissent and where you need to say we need national unity right now to defeat something greater? Well, so I think, um, built into that question is this idea that a lack of national unity somehow impairs society's ability to fight a great evil. Um, if there truly is a great evil that does require that type of uniformity of belief, then that's something that has to occur organically. Uh, that has to be something that is achieved because of the righteousness of the cause. Um, if, you, if, if someone were to say, look, this is a, a, a crucial uh, area where we all need to get on board with the same position, well, then it shouldn't be very hard to persuade people of that position if it really were so truly great and emergent of a situation. Uh, the moment where you start saying that this, this, this situation is so important that we're not even going to allow you to disagree, then we need to worry about the righteousness of that position because it's sort of this idea that Oliver Wendell Holmes articulated. It's about the marketplace of ideas. You know, the ideas that are correct, if they are articulated appropriately, they'll get the most believers. That's just how it will work. Um, and so there have been times in society where people, you know, clearly got behind and rallied behind the opposition to a threat. Uh, but that was because of the righteousness of the cause. And so I feel like even at those times, it's important to allow that avenue for people to articulate a different vision. Because as we've also seen, there have been times in history where we all got behind a certain cause, and with the benefit of hindsight, we can look back and say, we really shouldn't have done that. Um, so I kind of feel like that avenue should always be present. Hello, I'm Adrian Suarez. Um, thank you for your talk. I want to um, know your, your idea, your, your thoughts about the process of juridification of politics. You speak about uh, dissent in the in the realm of, of the law, but many times uh, we think of the law not as a place to forward arguments, but as to um, discuss what the law what the law says, what what should be done or, or what 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 can or cannot be done. Um, increasingly, we're seeing a, a process where uh, courts actually decide what must or mustn't be done, and. Uh, and I wonder uh, what degree of, of legitimacy um, you see you see in in, uh, in this process, uh, particularly today, where the presidency is trying to to crush that down, um, saying that uh, 
that judges are, are going over their jurisdiction, for example, in the, in the stay of the travel ban? All right, well, um, that's a good question. So it, it has to do mostly with the separation of powers. Um, and without making any specific comment on the current legal controversy, because I'm not allowed to really uh, talk about that specifically, but the spirit of your question, I think, uh, is highly relevant currently to uh, just how society functions. So with the system of checks and balances, not to get too intro to civics, but as we know, all the different branches of government have the ability to check the decisions of the other. And the, the system only really works if each individual component is doing what they're supposed to do and also not doing what they're not supposed to do. It's supposed to be that the legislature, elected rep representatives, will create laws. The executive will enforce those laws. And the judiciary will interpret uh, decisions either to determine the validity of a law or to determine whether the mode of enforcement is legal or not. So then the question is, well, who, who is supposed to check the courts, right? If the, the people can elect the legislature, but the courts can strike down their decisions and the courts can strike down executive decisions, who can strike down the courts? Uh, and that's sort of the conundrum. Uh, the ability for a court to strike down a law is known as judicial review. That is not in the Constitution. Judicial review is an ability that was created by the courts. So the courts have the ability to strike down laws because the courts have said they have the ability to strike down laws. And that causes panic <laughs> among some people, right? You feel like these are the people who are not elected directly by the, the population and yet can overturn the decisions of people who were elected by the public. And that can create a constitutional crisis. Uh, my response to that is, it's important to have a judiciary that is independent from popular opinion because that's the only way minorities can be protected in a society that has majority rule. Uh, the majority doesn't really need protecting because they can elect who they want. Uh, the only branch of government that is required to be responsive to the needs of minorities is the judicial branch. Now, if the public and the executive and the legislature all decide, you know what, we disagree with the courts, we're just gonna do what we want, they can do that. And in history, that's, that's been done. Uh, that's because the court lost its credibility with the public. So it's up to the courts to make their decisions and their decision-making process in a way that maintains public confidence and enhances public credibility of the institution. Because once the, that's all the courts have, right? The, the Supreme Court can make a decision telling the president to do something or telling Congress to do something, and they can be ignored. And the only way that that can be prevented is if the public becomes outraged. So as long as the courts maintain credibility with the public at large by how they come to their decisions and the decisions that they make, that's the only way that the courts can even have any power at the end of the day. Um, so it's kind of an esoteric answer to your question. Uh, and it's not, honestly, it's not an easy answer. It's something, hopefully, uh, that doesn't play out in our current situation. Um, but obviously, th once, once people lose faith in their civic institutions, the courts in particular, uh, you know, this democracy will run off the rails. And uh, I'm hoping that doesn't happen. Hi, uh, my name is XY. I'm from Pomona College. Thank you so much for coming. I have a question about the value of um, dissent and whether or not it changes depending on who is coming from and who is director at. So I'm thinking, especially recently and over the last few years, about the rise of like white supremacy, and that that some some of them portray themselves as like a voice of dissent, like fighters of the suppressed voices. So th does the value of dissent change depending on you know whether it's coming from the powerful or the powerless? And what are your thoughts on that? All right, that's a really good question, and that's honestly that's the trick, right? It's, it's easy to love the First Amendment if everyone is saying what you think or what you agree with. Um, then there'd be really no point of having it. Uh, it's something that we see on college campuses. You know, when I was here as a student back in the day, you know, this idea of political correctness was first becoming a thing. You know, it wasn't even really, it was a phrase that was coined basically as I was starting at Pomona College. And there became this idea that in order to be respectful to certain people, the way you say things is important, and so you shouldn't say things that are disrespectful or will hurt people's sensibilities. And I think that comes from a good place, uh, because oftentimes what you are allowed to say will affect how you think. 
And you know, we can all agree on the general principle that everyone should be respectful of everybody else. That's easy. Uh, what do we do when people are saying things that we disagree with? What do we do when people are, are expressing opinions that we can't stand? You know, Walker Wall on Pomona campus is, is a very popular place where people can express whatever opinion they want. And you know, while I was there, some pretty you know, innocuous things like Star Wars or whatever were written up there, but some political ideas were painted on that wall, uh, some of which were extremely harmful, perhaps even threatening to people. And my view was then and is now that we have to have that vehicle to express. First of all, it's a good thing in a sense because it's good to know what people really believe. People can walk, out through, walk, walk around through the day being polite to each other, and little do you know, they you know, are harboring these really harmful opinions that never come to the light of day. The appropriate way to deal with harmful, opinions that are harmful to the individual and to society is to counter those opinions, not to silence them. That's how this position, that's how the free society is supposed to work. And it's true, sometimes dissent comes from the powerless, uh, with a noble cause, it's hard to disagree with that. Sometimes it comes from people who want to oppress other people. It's easy to disagree with that, but it doesn't mean that they shouldn't be allowed to say it. Um, and then ultimately, the marketplace of ideas will prevail. You know, we've seen all, on a lot of college campuses where s invited speakers would get all of these protests, right? To the point where then the college has to decide whether we're gonna have this talk or not. Um, I see where that sensitivity comes from. But you also have to understand what people are trying to achieve, you know, provocateurs, what they're trying to achieve. Oftentimes, by protesting and by preventing them from speaking, you've given them exactly what they want. You've given them attention, a level of attention and importance that they before didn't have. And if there's a speaker who comes to your campus that you think is going to spew something hateful that you disagree with, what's the appropriate response? to give them what they want? Or is it to not attend? Or maybe having a counter presentation somewhere else that will draw a bigger audience? Uh, you have to be strategic about that. Uh, but the solution is never in making a decision for other people what can be said and what can be heard. We have time for one to two more final questions. Please raise your hand. Hi, my name is Ali. Uh, I'm a student at Pomona. And I was wondering if you had any particular instances in your judicial um, career or in your career as a lawyer which particularly taught you the importance of dissent and if that particular case has influenced your, the rest of your career thus far. Well, you know, I wouldn't say that there's any case in particular other than um, some of the re academic reading I have done. Because honestly, it was a surprise to me uh, until I read some of these decisions around the sedition acts, like around World War I, between World War I and World War II. I, like a lot of you, thought that freedom of speech has always meant the same thing, which is if you say something that disagrees with the government, you're allowed to say it because it's a free country. And just looking a l not even that far back into our history, you know, it was revealed to me that it hasn't always been that, ca that way. And particularly at times of crisis, war or you know, external, internal threat that's real or perceived, those are the times where I realize our democracy is very fragile and there's this temptation to start compromising on some of our values at the times that we need those values the most. People tend to have a very short memory, right? Uh, there have been times where fairly recently you know, society's galvanized around a position or an opinion that within fairly short order is revealed to be completely false and harmful. And I experienced that really as a citizen as much as as a judge. And I hope that when, by people talking about this issue and having some degree of fidelity to our national values in a democratic society, especially at those times of crisis, I hope that that's how we can prevent these sorts of uh, problems from reoccurring. Though for some reason it seems like, you know, we're on a loop and we keep going through those, uh, those periods of crisis that lead us to compromise who we are. 
I think that is probably all the time we have, so everyone came to class. Please join me in thanking Judge William Honeydina for joining us. Thank you. <laughs>